Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this has been a, uh, a great event. I've really enjoyed the presentations. Uh, however, I find myself among uh, a series of compelling presentations and uh, inspiring messages uh, having the dubious task of talking to you about building codes. Uh, however, uh, I, I happen to be one of a very small minority out there that thinks that building codes really are sexy. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about building codes and I want to try to help connect the dots and show how you have a role in this, this overall uh, project to create a more resilient world through building codes. And so with that, I want to give you just a little bit of a background. I'm, I'm, uh, as, uh, uh, as Lance mentioned, I am, I am the state building codes director. Uh, mentioned uh, Jack Layden, a colleague of mine who's a state building code commissioner in Rhode Island. Uh, and so I play a similar role uh, in New York. And uh, in, my, in my office in, in Albany, we're responsible for maintaining the state's building and energy codes. And I just want to give you a little background to how this all works. The Uniform Fire Prevention and Building Code, which is the, the document that, uh, that you ultimately use in, in New York to design buildings. And when I talk about New York, I'm talking about the state of New York. The city has an exemption and, uh, and creates its own uh, building and fire prevention codes. Uh, the Uniform Code, uh, utilizes, and this has been going on for about 10 years, the international codes as, uh, as a structure for our building code regulations. I'm going to talk a little bit about the ICC uh, in just a minute. The state building code also has to incorporate statutory standards that are created by the state legislature. Uh, and we also, as, as you all know, have to uh, coordinate with the myriad of state regulations that touch upon building construction uh, throughout the state. Uh, now, when I talk about the energy code, the energy code is actually separate and distinct from the, from the state building code, and that's because each of those documents is created by a separate statute. And so uh, we, they, they both apply to building construction, but they exist in separate statutes. And, and one of the distinctions to the state energy code is the state energy code also does apply in the city of New York. Those of you who are practicing in New York City probably understand that there is a, there's a state energy code that you have to comply with, but the city also has its own energy code overlay. And so, so that's one of the, one of the challenges that, uh, that we face. And this is something that, that I have found is probably one of the biggest challenges of my office is trying to help you trying to help the communities that are, uh, that are affected by building codes, trying to create as much as possible a simplified approach to building regulation. And that's not an easy task uh, in New York or, or anywhere. And so, uh, so that's, that's one thing that, that we're constantly addressing. And, and we're going to talk a little bit about resilience, building resilience. There was a, there was a comment made that resilience is really the next the next big issue, and I happen to completely agree with that. Uh, and so the challenge that we all face is how do we integrate resilience into the building regulatory uh, structure in a way that is thoughtful, uh, that, is, uh, that is smart, and that is, that is not going to be overly burdensome. And so, again, a little bit about the, the International Codes. These are documents that are published by the International Code Council. Uh, the ICC is a not-for-profit association that essentially creates the, the building codes uh, that, that states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and states around the country utilize as the basis for their regulatory codes. Uh, this is something that happens voluntarily. The state of New York uh, didn't use the ICC codes as our base until uh, 2003. Uh, and again, those who are practicing in the city uh, probably uh, remember back when the city of New York uh, did, 
did something similar and uh, chose to utilize the uh, international codes as a basis for, uh, for the city codes. And so one of the things, one of the benefits that, that I find is that probably in the history uh, of the uh, tumultuous relationship between the city and state of New York, we probably, our codes are probably as close as they've ever been uh, because of the international codes and, and the base structure that, that we use. Now the ICC codes are created by something called the governmental consensus process. This is a national code development process uh, that, that uh, essentially allows for open debate and consideration of an ongoing evolution of these model code documents. Every three years, the ICC publishes a new set of, uh, of international codes. And the reason for that is to keep pace with uh, the construction industry. I'm sure you will all agree with me that the, uh, the construction industry uh, and, uh, and how we design buildings is constantly changing. Uh, and that's because of new products and materials that are out there that might give us an advantage in terms of the design process. It's because of new systems that are being developed uh, that, that can be used in more efficient ways. Uh, and, it, and it also, uh, one of the things that the international codes uh, give to us is a constant updating of all of the technical standards that we have to use for uh, the design of systems and, uh, and, and the technical aspects of, uh, of how we construct buildings. Those are the NFPA standards, the ASCE standards, the ASTM standards. Those standards are automatically updated every three years through the ICC process. Now this is a process, I'm gonna to talk to you at the end a little bit about how you can participate in that process, but this is something that is open to everyone. You don't have to be a code official to be part of the process. You don't have to be an architect or an engineer. You just have to think building codes are sexy and you're in, okay? <laughs> so, so don't think there's no role for me to play in the development of building codes. So right now where we are, the, the, the state of New York currently utilizes uh, the 2006 edition of the international codes. We're a little bit behind. Uh, and we're trying to catch, we're pr trying to play catch up. We're, we're working to adopt the 2012 uh, international codes. Currently, the 2012 I codes, that's the most current edition out there, but we're constantly playing catch up because at the middle of this year, the 2015 codes will be out and published and available for jurisdictions to consider. So again, it's a constant game of catch up, but right now we're focused on the 2012 I codes. Uh, this is something that the State Code Council uh, established as a goal uh, back when we chose to use the international codes uh, about 10 years ago. The, the State Code Council, which is the regulatory body that adopts and maintains the state building codes, saw this three-year process that was going on and said, you know, we need to do something. We need to try to stick with some sort of a process that develops a consistent approach to updating building codes, and in so doing, make sure that the state is constantly improving uh, the way that it, that it regulates building construction. And so we've been, we've been trying to keep consistent with that three-year process. Some, some cycles were a little bit better at it, some cycles were not quite as good. But that's really what the goal of the, uh, of the, the Code Council has been. Now the, the Code Council also utilizes a series of technical subcommittees uh, to review these documents uh, and to provide recommendations on how those documents will serve the interests of the state of New York and all of our communities that are impacted by that. Those code councils included represented representation from uh, the design community, uh, code officials, fire officials, uh, product manufacturers, et cetera. So we had a, a, a wide range of interests and perspectives at the table to take a look at these documents and see how they would serve us in the future. That process is essentially complete and we're ready to update the codes. So we're, as I mentioned, we're talking about two separate uh, and distinct codes, the energy code and the building codes, the uniform code as we call them. Uh, for the commercial energy code, we are about to 
and this could happen within the next month or so, uh, we will be publishing uh, the beginning of our, of our public review uh, of an update that would essentially move to the 2010 edition of ASHRAE 90.1 and the 2012 IECC, that's the International Energy Conservation Code. Now, uh, my, my understanding is that uh, in terms of how buildings are designed and constructed, uh, if you're talking about a larger scale building, a high rise in, in midtown Manhattan or, or a large scale building, ASHRAE 90.1 tends to be the uh, the document of choice. In, in upstate New York, uh, where, we, where we're uh, predominantly smaller scale, low rise construction, the IECC tends to be the document that's being used. And, as, and one of the things that we had to do as a state was figure out, okay, we have these two energy codes, how do we, how do we, how do we make this work? And so what we've essentially uh, created, and we'll be doing this with uh, with this update to the energy code is we create compliance alternatives. Depending upon, depending upon what type of building you're constructing, depending upon what document is going to serve you as a designer uh, best, you can use one path or, or another. And so we're hoping that that flexibility provides uh, some benefit to the design community and ultimately uh, create uh, buildings that are more efficient uh, with with respect to using energy. Uh, the rest of the building codes, this is the building code, the residential code, all of those other codes that, uh, that complement uh, the uniform fire prevention and building code. Uh, we are, we are uh, probably going to be moving uh, to update those codes to use, utilize the 2012 uh, international codes. Sometime, I would say the middle to latter part of this year, we'll, we'll start that public process. So that's where we are right now. Crystal ball tends to be a little bit murky when we're talking about uh, projecting when we're going to update and uh, actually put into effect uh, building codes, but that's really what the, what the process is right now. One thing I did want to mention about the energy code, one of the things that has been driving uh, the, the development of the energy code is the U, uh, U.S. Department of Energy. The federal government, uh, ironically, has been issuing mandates to states to update their state energy codes for over 20 years. I think it's been since the 1970s uh, that DOE has been issuing these mandates. But interestingly, after the economic recession and the crisis that we faced back in 2009, states started to look at this more seriously because DOE tied financial incentives to updating the energy code. And so back when the federal stimulus legislation went into effect in 2009, uh, states like New York were given financial incentives if they would update their energy code to certain standards. So we did, many states, most states around the country did, and they benefited uh, financially. They got more money in the federal stimulus uh, for their state. And so that's, been, that's captured the attention of states like New York. Now, interestingly, this, uh, this mandate that has been issued by DOE is tied to no financial incentives. So, so we're, not, we're not expecting that by updating the code to, uh, to these new standards that we will, that we'll somehow get another pot of, uh, a pot of money at the end of the rainbow. However, uh, now, now the, the decision makers the attorneys that, uh, that uh, inform the decision makers all are aware of these mandates that DOE is, uh, is issuing. So they're, they're being more sensitive to that. So, okay, let's talk a little bit about resilience. We've talked about the, the codes, but the question is, what about resilience? What, you know, we've, we've just gone through these uh, tremendously uh, disastrous uh, events that have changed the course of how we live our lives uh, in, in uh, states like New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, which were affected by Sandy. Uh, and then, of course, before that, Katrina, uh, uh, Irene, and Lee. And, and there was, a, there was a, uh, an image of the, the cloud of Katrina. These events are, are more and more often shaping how we live our lives, how we, uh, how we have to rebuild our lives. And as, as regulators, uh, and specifically 
a regulator that's responsible for maintaining building codes, how do we, how do we, how do we respond to this in a, in a, in a sensitive uh, and smart way? And so, so one of the things that, that we did, especially after Sandy, was we really took a look at, uh, at the, the effects of the storm on, on buildings and uh, in these high-risk areas, and we listened very carefully to some of the conversations that were going on, just like the conversations that are going on in this room today. Uh, it, one of the things that, that did happen right after Sandy, Governor Cuomo appointed three separate commissions uh, to study all of the aspects of how Sandy uh, had affected our state. Uh, so there, was, there were pieces about building code, but it included everything uh, from in infrastructure to transportation uh, to how it affected the energy, uh, uh, the power grid, you name it, it was in there. But part of that was building codes. And so, so we've taken some of the recommendations, some of the science that was gathered from, uh, uh, from those commissions, and we've developed some recommendations that we're going to be presenting uh, to our state code council regarding building resilience. Uh, another, another great partner in this has been FEMA. Uh, and uh, regardless of what you might think about FEMA, they do a tremendous job at, uh, at helping uh, states and jurisdictions in times of need. Uh, and and uh, the resources that they devote to help us are something we really have to uh, be thankful for. Uh, FEMA, FEMA presented a series of recommendations specifically to the state of New York uh, that, that, uh, that gave us some reason to think about uh, changing uh, uh, amending our building codes so that we could create a more resilient framework for uh, building regulation. And so we've, we've uh, included a little bit of that. And also, our, uh, our colleagues in the city of New York. Uh, si New York City was probably as hard hit as any, any place uh, at, by Sandy. And so, so one of the things that we did, we, we, uh, we listened to, we sat down with our colleagues at the Department of Buildings in New York City. Uh, we saw some of the changes that were being presented, proposed, and implemented in the city building code, and we are assessing their uh, viability as uh, provisions statewide. Now, some of those provisions that are, that are uh, being implemented in New York City are not necessarily going to translate well to the building stock, to the density, to the structure uh, that, that exists in other communities around the state. But there are some uh, of those changes that, that uh, were just as viable anywhere in the state as they might be in the city of New York. And so uh, we'll talk just a little bit about a couple of those proposals. Again, with, uh, with uh, sh a short amount of time, there's not a lot I can uh, give you in terms of detail. But uh, one of the things that, uh, that, we, that we saw uh, that, that uh, a recommendation came through on was uh, the, the compliance path for residential construction in coastal high hazard areas. Uh, it, the Residential Code of New York, that uh, for those of you that, that use that in your practice, you, you recognize there's, a, there's essentially a prescriptive path uh, to complying with uh, its section 324 uh, for in, if you're in coastal high hazard areas. And so one of the things that, that we felt would give uh, designers, architects, some more flexibility, but still meet the standards that we needed for uh, for resilience and safety in New York was to use ASCE 24 as a more direct compliance uh, option for uh, for the designer. So that's that's one of the proposals that that we're looking at. Another in the in the building code in the building code when I mentioned that. That affects all of the other occupancy classifications other than one and two family dwellings and townhouses. So this would be something where uh, we're talking about all of the other types of buildings. Uh, high hazard occupancy buildings, uh, class H as, as we recognize them, that was one of the things that, that we saw that these buildings, uh, when they existed in, uh, in a flood zone and high hazard areas, uh, presented a tremendous risk to the occupants uh, of that area uh, and also uh, the, the cleanup that might be involved, 
the, the issues, the complexity of bringing those types of buildings back on the line in, in online after they have been uh, impacted by an extreme weather event uh, caused us to take a look at the viability of uh, locating those types of buildings in, uh, in flood prone areas. And so we're taking a look at this. Now when I say we're taking a look at this, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're, this is going to happen. These are discussions that are ongoing. Uh, and, uh, and so that is, that's one of the areas where we are studying the potential of creating further restrictions uh, in the building code when it comes to these types of situations. Uh, another is, uh, is actually with respect to the building code, uh, the, the flood loading uh, that, that a building has to withstand in a flood hazard areas. And, uh, and, and understanding the, the, tremendous, uh, the tremendous strain that a building is put through uh, when, it, when, it is, when you see these types, of, uh, these types of pictures and how they affect the loading on, on a building. And so one of the things that we're talking about is taking an approach somewhat similar to the residential code. Uh, you, you probably know that, that when you're in a flood, uh, a, a, a flood zone and you're talking about a one or two family dwelling that you're constructing, you've got to construct that to two feet above uh, the design flood of, uh, base flood elevation. Well, we're talking about the potential of, of expanding that kind of approach uh, for other types of building occupancies. Now, in ASCE 24, there, you go to the table and you do see there are some occupancies where you do have to raise those occupancies uh, to a certain extent uh, above the design flood elevation, but we're talking about creating some more restrictions so that the new buildings that come online, as more buildings uh, are constructed in these, in these high hazard areas, we're constructing them at levels that are going to minimize uh, the risk and hopefully mitigate potential future disasters. Uh, and then uh, another, another thing that, that we're talking about is the specific uh, area of healthcare, healthcare occupancies, and, and how do we, how do we uh, prepare these important structures, these important, uh, these important occupancies to continue to be online uh, and to continue to function uh, in, in, uh, in extreme weather events. And so we're talking about additional provisions for electrical systems and components, uh, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, uh, and, and trying to create the, uh, a better approach to how you construct these types of buildings so that they are going to serve the needs of those who need them most at the times when we need them most. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is, a, this is another one. This was one that, that uh, we learned a lot from, from the city, and this was very specifically in larger types of buildings, and specifically residential buildings. Uh, when, when a building is inundated by flooding, how do we, how do we create a, a situation where we're gonna be able to provide access to potable water? Seems like a pretty simple thing, but you probably read the reports, you probably heard some of the accountings of people that were trapped in their homes literally without the ability to, uh, to access potable water. It became a major issue. And so in these, some of these high hazard extreme areas, uh, we're looking at uh, creating a, a, a better uh, methodology for providing access to potable water when, uh, when, when we have an extreme weather event. Uh, and then finally, the, the issue of the materials that are, that are utilized in building construction uh, in flood hazard zones. There, certainly there are some provisions in the, in the codes now that dictate the use of, uh, of certain types of materials uh, when, you, when you know that you have a high potential for uh, exposure to flood, flooding. But we're, we're taking a, a closer look at that and, and we're, trying to, we're trying to use, again, back to utilizing technology and the science of the day, we're trying to find uh, solutions that are, going to, that are going to create buildings that are constructed to better withstand uh, the effects of, of flooding in the future. 
So talked a lot about more, 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 more building codes, more regulation, more money, you name it, okay? That's, 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 part, of the, that's part of the story. And when, when you're hit by a natural disaster, the tendency in the building regulatory world is to want more. We want to create more requirements, more provisions, uh, more restrictions. However, part of the responsibility of my office is to try to balance that more with the reality that exists out there. Uh, we all, as practitioners, we all understand that uh, you can create the safest building in the world on paper, but you may not be able to build it because it costs too much. And so part of, part of the goal here is to create a balanced approach to building resilience to take a look at all of these, uh, all of these experiences and to find uh, the provisions to provide, find the solutions that best serve our interests and create that balance in the end so that we can continue to, uh, to create uh, great buildings uh, that are better prepared uh, to withstand the, uh, the effects of the future. Uh, and another, another uh, goal, it's not really a goal, it's one of the mandates of my office is to assure that we are establishing, that we are keeping with the minimum level of health and safety uh, that, that government is responsible uh, to consider, that, that architects and practitioners uh, have an obligation to, uh, to your clients to, uh, to consider and to ultimately uh, make sure that our communities are, are doing everything that they need to when, when we're talking about constructing buildings uh, in, in a manner that, that, that meets those minimum standards that we've all accepted for health and safety. And so finally, uh, I, I end with a cliche, and I hate cliches as much as all of you do. However, I can't think of a better way to use a cliche. You have to be part of the solution if we're gonna have a solution. As a, as, a, as a registered practicing architect in the, in the building regulatory world, I can't emphasize to you enough how important it is that you be part of this discussion. The fact that you're here, that you have an interest in the, the, how resilience uh, is, how building, how disasters are affecting our communities and how resilience uh, can be done in a thoughtful way. That means you've already taken a step, but there are so many ways that, that you uh, can be part of the solution, and that, that can happen at the local level. We talked a lot about the local planning processes uh, that, that are going on uh, and the discussions that are happening at the local level. Be part of those discussions. Bring your experience, bring your expertise, uh, and, and bring your concerns uh, to those discussions. At the state level, the development of the state building code cannot happen in a vacuum. If we just have government bureaucrats creating state building codes, it's going to happen to you. Don't let that happen. Be part of the process, and there are ways that you can do that. And if you want to be part of the process but you're not sure how, contact me, contact our office, and we can, we can tell you how you and your organization can be part of the solution. And then finally at the national level, I mentioned the International Code Council. These documents that we use as, our, uh, as the base for our state building codes are created by an open process that includes uh, all, wa all walks of the industry, including architects, engineers. The AIA is a huge uh, participant in the national uh, code development process, but they can't do it alone. They need to have the wisdom that all of you have uh, that, that you get every day by designing buildings uh, in situations where challenges face you. So be part of the discussion, be part of the solution, and if we do that, then building codes can connect to those uh, compelling presentations. They can connect to the inspiring messages that you have, and I, I, uh, I maintain that building codes can be sexy, so, uh, so <laughs> give it a second thought. Thank you. <laughs>